it's a real pleasure to be here again uh, at the, the humanist community in Santa Clara uh, in Silicon Valley. Um, and I'm delighted to see this, this new space also. It's, it's really great. So, um, yeah, so uh, I have, um, I, I am, by the way, uh, in case you're interested, I'm, I'm an atheist and I'm largely a vegetarian. So I think we're in alignment in many ways. Um, I, I, I have, a, have spent many years in, in the Middle East, of which uh, some of the time was spent in Saudi Arabia, um, other countries like Lebanon, Iran. So many of the countries that are, that are sort of in the news today. And uh, Saudi Arabia is, is a country that has been in the news for various reasons. Um, and I think most recently, you've heard a lot about the conflict between Iran and, 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 and Saudi Arabia and the, and the role that Saudi Arabia is playing in this, in this, con this conflict, uh, sort of a long ongoing conflict between these two countries. So I'll talk a little bit about that. But actually this, uh, I have been asked to, to g actually give two talks here. So another talk will happen, I think, in August, where I will talk more about the, the geopolitical role that, that Saudi Arabia plays, its relationship to Iran and, and, and um, U.S. Foreign, foreign policy towards Saudi Arabia, why U.S. foreign policy uh, is so aligned with Saudi Arabia. So I won't talk too much about that today. I'll talk more about what is happening inside Saudi Arabia, and and um, you know the reasons why it behaves the way that it, that it does. Um, the other reason that Saudi Arabia has been in the news, of course, I mean, long term, it's always been it has been the number one oil exporter for as long as I can remember, and for that reason, uh, it has been the sort of de facto leader of OPEC, the, the Organization of Petroleum Exporting Countries. Uh, Saudi Arabia produces, so for, for a long time, Saudi Arabia was the number one oil producer in the world uh, as a member of OPEC. And now, very recently, both Russia and the United States have overtaken Saudi Arabia in terms of production. But Saudi Arabia still exports more crude oil than any other country. So it plays a crucial role in, in the supply for for other countries like Europe, uh, like China, like India, uh, that are dependent on on imported oil. Uh, so it produces about right now about around 10.5 to 11 million barrels per day uh, out of out of the total total global production of, of maybe 98 98 million barrels per day. So it's about we're talking about 11% of, of global production of crude oil. Um, so another reason that Saudi Arabia has been in the news recently, of course, has been the, the, the killing of Jamal Khashoggi, uh, the, the Washington Post journalist. And so I'll talk a little bit more about that. And um, another reason sort of in, a recent, in the recent uh, past is Saudi Arabia's sort of disputed role with respect to jihadism or Islamic um, militancy uh, originating in the Middle East and seemingly spreading, spreading terror around different, different places in the world. So we'll talk about all of these issues. Uh, Saudi Arabia's location in um, in the Middle East is why well, actually I should talk about the cartoon a little bit. So, so, the, so the cartoon, the, the reason I made, I made this cartoon is because we, we also hear that, that Saudi Arabia is, is, um, is an ally with the U.S. against, against uh, terrorism and you know, they, they play, they put a lot of funding into the, the conflict in Syria, for example. In fact, they they send out a, a lot of money to every to everybody. I mean, one of the biggest recipients of Saudi aid 
is Egypt. And um, what happened in 2013, after, after the Arab Spring, 2013, the, the current president, um, Abdel Fattah al-Sisi, uh, took power. Um, he sort of seized, seized power and, and overthrew the elected president, Mohamed Morsi, who was a member of the, the Muslim Brotherhood. Now, the Muslim Brotherhood has no history as a, I mean, most countries do not, have never classified uh, the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt as, as a terrorist organization. But it is an organization that has been sort of kept under control by what has essentially been a, a continuum of, of governments in Egypt that, that are based on the power of the military. So even, even if we had a civilian president in Egypt like, uh, like, like Mubarak, and he, he himself was a general before he became president, and his primary backing has always been the Egyptian military. Um, and, and so, the, uh, the, so the, there was this conflict between the Egyptian military and, and the Muslim Brotherhood. And, and Saudi Arabia has always given a lot of support to the Egyptian military, hoping to, to eliminate the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So Saudi Arabia has played this role, a very, very partisan role, against certain Islamic movements around the world. It claims to be, to be fighting against ISIS. It claims to be fighting against Al-Qaeda. Um, and we'll talk more about that. So it is, it's done this, but at the same time, it has, it promotes an ideology, both internally and externally, that, that is very, very fundamentalist, that, that leads it that itself is not militant, but can lead to militancy. So it creates this, this ideological framework for, for people in Al-Qaeda and ISIS to develop. Uh, so Saudi Arabia is, is very central to the, to the uh, area that we're talking about, even though I'm not going to talk too much about the, the, uh, uh, the context. But you have Iran, you have Egypt. You have Yemen, which is uh, where there's a war going on, where Saudi Arabia has led a coalition uh, attacking uh, Yemen. And you see the basically Saudi Arabia and Kuwait, and then everything to the south of that, that is the, the Arabian Peninsula. So I'm going to refer to that, that Arabian Peninsula from, from time to time. And it consists of seven countries. Now, of these, of these seven countries of the Arabian Peninsula, which is Saudi Arabia, Kuwait, Bahrain, Qatar, the United Arab Emirates, Oman, and Yemen. Of these seven countries, six of them are members of what's called the GCC, the, the Gulf Cooperation Council. And so those are all of them except Yemen. So what those six have in common is that they are all oil exporters and they are all monarchies. Yemen is the only one that is not a monarchy and is not an oil producer. Okay. So this sort of gives you a little bit of the geography of, of Saudi Arabia. The, the, the main part of the country is this sort of, sort of uh, high plateau, and the the eastern part, the, you know, the green area. So that is low-lying land, and that's where the oil is. And so all of the oil facilities are out there in the east. The big refineries, the big the big uh, oil ports, are all there, and the uh, the oil, the oil flow started in the in when it, after it was discovered in the in the 1930s by by U.S. oil companies. Four of these U.S. oil companies got together and they formed a a, a joint venture called uh, Aramco, Arabian American Oil Company. And so Aramco became the the producer of oil in Saudi Arabia. And um, in, in the 80s, Saudi Arabia nationalized Aramco. It paid, it paid uh, the oil companies for the acquisition, but it nationalized it and renamed it Saudi Aramco. So that's what it is today. You hear about it, Saudi Aramco is the sole oil company and it's state owned uh, in Saudi Arabia. And um, of course, you know, the 
percent of government revenues are coming from this, from from the sale of and taxation of crude oil. The capital is in the Riyadh, and you see on the on the left you have Medina and Makkah. These are these are the two holy cities, and uh, this this in sense in a way in many ways shapes some of the of the history and uh, the evolution of the of the kingdom. So the kingdom was was founded in the 1930s by King Abdul Aziz Saud and he sort of established the House of Saud as the as the monarchy that would rule the kingdom uh, thereafter and it was done so by by making an alliance I mean the, the kingdom before that was was divided into tribes and it was not unified and the only way of unifying the, the country was to was to make this this pact this allegiance uh, this alliance with the Islamic fundamentalists. They were what are in the West called Wahhabis. In Saudi Arabia the term is not used. But um, uh, so so the, this uh, this alliance meant, meant that the, the monarchy would uh, do everything it can, at least at least from from the standpoint of the external perception, it would project itself as the guardian of Islam and the guardian of this, this very conservative Islamic fundamentalism. And, and so, so that's why the kingdom is so committed to, to promulgating this, this type of very conservative Islam, is because of this alliance. And, and then King Fahd, uh, I think it was in the 80s or, 80s or so, that, that he added a, a title to himself, which every king after that would bear, and that is that in addition to being the monarch, uh, he took on the title of the guardian of the two holy sites of Al Medina and Makkah. And uh, so it just, it just, but all of this, remember, is, is only there to, to legitimize the monarchy by, by tying it to Islam, by tying it to something that's sacred to the people of the country. Just to give you a, just a brief glimpse of what what a lot of the country looks like, the so the central plateau is 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 dry, but there you have these a lot of these escarpments, um, a mixture of, of rocky landscape and and sand dunes, and this is an oasis. And when, when you see an oasis, you might see a some, and there still are some some nomadic nomadic people who who drive their their uh, their sheep and goats. Um, from one one oasis to another, the often you see princes uh, attending a, a horse race, and uh, I, mean, I mean, this is just one context where where one might be able to see some members of, of the royal family. Of course, the royal family always has these very special uh, seats um, where they can uh, have a, you know a little bit of uh, privacy and. And uh, an exclusive space. Um, so th this was a very unusual scene. So I, I was I spent a number of years in Saudi Arabia as a, uh, doing medical research, and so one of the things that happened when I was there was that there was a medical conference, and the medical conference was hosted by the by the Saudi National Guard. <laughs> now the Saudi National Guard was, you know, most countries have have basically two two ministries that handle security, right? I mean, there may be some other agencies, but basically there are two. There's the, the police and security services and the military. So in Saudi Arabia, there's a, there's a third force, which is the Saudi National Guard. And the reason for the, the, the Saudi National Guard was, was created was because uh, you had the police, but you know the police are, are lightly armed, and the military. But the problem is that in the early days of the kingdom, the Saudi military did not have the know-how to run a modern military organization. So, for example, roles that required more skills, like like fighter pilots. So, Saudi Arabia didn't have any fighter pilots who, who knew how to knew how to operate, you know, advanced aircraft. So they brought pilots from Pakistan and maybe a few other countries. And so the, the 
for many years, the, the pilots of the Pakistani Air Force were, I mean, the, the Saudi Air Force were Pakistani. And so there was a question about, are they really loyal? When it, if it came to a war, would they really be loyal to Saudi Arabia? So they created the Saudi National Guard as this third force that is more heavily armed than the police, but can also serve as a counterweight to the military in case something went wrong. And it also reflected that the royal family has always had this paranoia of, of being challenged from a security perspective or, or possibly being overthrown or facing a mutiny. So anyway, so this was, this was a medical conference and it was in the Saudi National Guard headquarters and they invited all of his medical people and they had, a, had this dinner in, in the football stadium. And so the, the, what it was is they, they this, is, this is in very traditional Saudi style, is that you sit on the ground, there's a, there's a big plate with, with rice and a, and a lamb that has been, each one of these big round plates is a, has a lamb that has been, been cooked and roasted under the, the sands and you know, lavishly showing off the, 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 abund the abundance of the kingdom. Even though most of this food, of course, has to be imported from, well, from, from, from all over the world. So, so when you, yes? Well, someone has a question, says you can't get recorded, would you repeat it? Okay, so, so the question is from where, where does the food come from? And so the, the food uh, comes from all over the world. I mean, you get, you get products from, I mean, it's amazing because um, here we don't, we don't appreciate how, how global the, the world food system is, except that some, you know, some of our, well, a lot of our foods come from south of the border. Um, uh, but in Saudi Arabia, in the Middle East countries, you get, uh, you know, canned goods, I mean, non-perishable goods um, from, from Australia, New Zealand, from, from Europe, from Lebanon, from, from the U.S., from South America. Um, from East Africa, so it, it really comes from from everywhere, and um, yeah, it's 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 really uh, an eye opener to see all this the, this stuff coming in. Um, another thing that, that has happened, of course, and this is particularly after 1974. 1974, what happened was that OPEC was created, and OPEC decided to quadruple the price of oil. Many of you will remember that. And the quadrupling of, of oil prices meant that Saudi Arabia and other oil producing countries suddenly had a lot of money. So what happened after that was this construction boom. And if you just take a look out your window, you see just a forest of construction cranes. And now to, to do the construction, of course, uh, the country needed labor. And the Saudis have been spoiled. They've been spoiled by by government handouts. Um, they are of mostly of, of nomadic origin, at least those in the cent the center of the country. Um, and so they didn't particularly want to do this kind of hard work of bringing construction because imagine you have to do this in, in the blazing sun, right? And and the temperature outside is is like 115 degrees. Fahrenheit. Okay. I don't know if you can imagine that. So the labor has to come from, from outside. So, the, so all the construction labor is brought in from other countries, from, from Egypt, from Sudan, from, from uh, Yemen, from uh, Pakistan, from Sri Lanka, from the Philippines, from India. So there are millions. In fact, in fact today, well, okay, so, so let's go back to this time. In, in, in this time, Saudi Arabia, I'm talking about, say, 1980. 1980, Saudi Arabia had a population of 8 million. And of those 8 million, 2 million were foreign, foreign workers and, and their families. Very few came with, on family status. So usually, the workers who were brought into Saudi Arabia were, were brought in on single status. They didn't have their families with them. Today, um, because Saudis have very, very large families, um, 
this, the population has exploded. So today, the population of Saudi Arabia is, is around 30, 31 million, 32 million. It's quadrupled since 1980. And the reason for that is, so I, so I when I was working there, I had, a, I had, for example, I had a technician who was a Saudi technician who was working for me. And if, it, if you asked him, okay, who are, how big is your family? How many brothers and sisters do you have? He said he would tell people, like most foreigners, he would tell them, oh, I have eight. I have, I have a, including myself, I have eight brothers and sisters. And, but because he knew me, you know, he, he, we became, you know, closer to each other. So he told me, well, I have 15. There are actually, we are actually 15 because he has, he has eight, eight brothers and sisters from, from his mother. Okay. But his father also has another wife and that other wife has seven kids. So there's totally 15. So that gives you some idea of the family size and why this population has, has exploded. So anyway, these foreign workers come in from, from all over the world, um, and they do all the hard labor out in the blazing sun. And um, they are, I'm just going to go through these quickly, uh, do all the cleaning work, all the, the menial type stuff, uh, work, even the security, a lot of the, the you know, the, the low-level security work is done by foreigners. Uh, and, and these are from like Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, um, even, well, a lot of the advanced, advanced, you know, highly skilled work, the scientific work. The, these are, these are um, nuclear, these, these are cells for handling nuclear materials in the hospital. Uh, because, yes? What was there before oil? Okay, so. Yeah, and when was oil discovered? Okay, so I, I mentioned to you that the oil was discovered in the in the in the early thirties, and uh, and the oil the first oil well test wells were well they were I mean they were dr the drilling began shortly after that. Um, before that, before oil, there were the place was largely um, so so you you had some cities like like Jeddah uh, on on the west coast, which were. Uh, Urban centers from for centuries, uh, uh, and as well as port cities, and uh, but the interior of the country was was mostly populated by nomads. There were some small towns like like uh, and and, uh, and 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 but most of the people in between were were nomads. Were poor. They were also poor. Yeah, they 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 didn't have they didn't have modern. Uh, conveniences. They, they basically lived in tents and, and moved from place to place. And so it's only in the in the past century that that these people have have become mostly settled. They have proper housing. They have plumbing. You know, running water and all that, and electricity. They didn't have that before. Education. Education was. I mean, women got no education before before that. I mean, except in in Jeddah and. And now I'll come to that because things have changed very dramatically. Um, you know, uh, foreign workers even in, in in other occupations like this this bakery here. So the foreign workers are housed in in in, uh, in housing like this, temporary housing. So when you have a construction site, you know you don't simply recruit from the local market. You bring the workers in, get in and set up trailers for. for mobile housing units and put all the workers in the mobile housing units on the construction site. Actually this is a pattern this is a pattern in, in much of Asia. So you have these little cubicles. So each, each cubicle called here uh, will house up to up to like four workers. Yes? I may be getting ahead of you. Um, these foreign workers, uh, what kind of salaries do they get? Uh, you are getting ahead of me. I'm coming to that. Okay, okay no, about the salaries. Okay, so so they so uh, this is you know back in the 80s, and there were all these. You go to any kind of international newspaper, particularly in in Asia, East Africa, Europe, and you'll see these ads for for workers, 
in, in Saudi Arabia or other Gulf countries for both unskilled as well as, as, well as highly skilled, highly trained people. And uh, the first, the, the pattern was established. The question is, how did this system get established? Right? And basically, it was created by Aramco. So this is the, 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 the largest uh, Aramco oil refinery, the Ras Tanura refinery. And um, this is the, uh, the biggest uh, crude oil terminal in the world uh, at, at the Ras Tanura. And uh, Saudi, when, when, when Saudi, when Aramco came in, okay, so what they did is they built whole cities from scratch. There was just, there was just desert. They, they built, um, essentially built Tehran um, and, and other cities on the, on the East Coast. And they built housing for most all of their workers. So the, these were the, the plans for the housing. They built, they built shops within those complexes for, for their workers. And here we come to pay. So, so the basic principle is, is to, um, well, for example, in, in this case, the pay of, of, of North American citizens. But what that means, I have to translate this, means US and Canadian. Uh, not Mexican, but U.S. and Canadians are called North Americans in Saudi Arabia, and they are they are paid according to according to what is um, a comparable pay in those countries in, in the U.S. and Canada, plus a an incentive pay. So so it, to make it attractive for workers to come from the U.S. and Canada, uh, they would they would provide this incentive pay plus a lot of other benefits, non-financial benefits, and vacation, and uh, as well as the housing. Now, but the interesting thing is, is that if you follow this principle, then you're going to come up with a different rate for uh, for people who are coming from other countries, like coming from India, Pakistan, or, or Yemen, and. And so what we have here is the, is the category one is, uh, let me see, so, so, so the, the page in front, okay, so the lower right is, is category three, which is Saudi nationals. Okay, so th this is a pay scale, and that's, I'm just showing a little part of it. The, the pay scale in a, in a government, so, so this is a system that was invented by Aramco, and then adopted by everybody else in the kingdom, including the Saudi government. So a Saudi government institution, in this case a hospital, because all hospitals in Saudi Arabia are government hospitals. Um, and by the way, Saudi Arabia has a, a what I call it is, is that Saudi Arabia has, has six single-payer health systems. Six single-payer health systems, because they have the, the Ministry of Health, they have the, the Defense Ministry, which has its own hospitals. The, the interior ministry or police, they have their set. The National Guard has their set. The Ministry of Education, that's the medical schools. And then the, the Royal Cabinet has, has one hospital, which is, which is this one in Riyadh, which is the one where we're in. These are monthly. Monthly? These are monthly. But these are in Saudi Riyadh. These are Saudi Riyadh, which are were about 3.75 to the dollar. So SR is Saudi Riyadh. The point is the point here is that is this, is that is that if you take the, the one in the lower right, so that's I'm going to use that sort of as the baseline. That's that's what is paid to Saudi citizens, and the the pay scale for for Indians, Pakistanis, Sudanese is is a little bit lower. Okay, so as you, if you just compare the. the so I'll come to that. So the next one is, is the one for the U.S. So that's the one in the back. And you see that the U.S. pay scale is roughly double the international or quite a bit, quite a bit higher than the Saudis. So what this means, of course, is that, is that yeah, it's, it's based on this principle that, that Aramco put out there, which is that you know, you're going to be paid something that is Comp First of all, the base is comparable to what you would get paid in your own country, but it means that 
Saudis also get discriminated against in their own country. Anyway, so th so this, it's a much more complicated because there's something like 15 different pay scales, of, of which I'm only showing you three here. So that's the system. Okay, so a lot of contradictions are still gonna are gonna come out here. Um, another thing that that leads to this incredible, <laughs> this crazy complexity, is is that because of this this alliance between the the royal family and the the, the fundamentalists. There is this, this mandated separation between men and women who are not married. But there are but there are various there are various levels of exceptions for Westerners and for for Westerners who are married, married couples. Right? So you create this complex system that on one day this this is this is an amenity center which has a swimming pool. Okay. And so on on Monday it's only Western employees and the job. So, I, so that means if you're Western, it doesn't matter the gender, everybody can come together. Okay, and then on, on Tuesdays, um, only, only men, uh, whether you're Western or, or non-Western. Okay, there's all kinds of discrimination that comes out of this, dividing, drawing lines between people, and so on. So there, there, it's, it, it's, it's a crazy, uh, complexity. What are the amenities? Well, the amenities, as I said, it includes a swimming pool. That, that's the main thing because, you know, when you go swimming, you take off most of your clothing. And, um, but there are other things, you know, there, there are other um, table tennis, tennis, um, other kinds of athletic facility, a gym, that sort of thing. Yes? Okay. Do you have a lot of slides? Uh, I'm probably going to run out of time, right? Yeah, so you have to stop answering questions from people from the audience or you're not going okay. to get through them. Okay, so, so I'll take the questions at the end. Yeah. Okay, let me go quickly. Um, there's a lot of labor abuse, and so there, was, or there were all these, these are sort of letters that are evidence of the complaints by, by foreign workers of their, of their treatment, the fact that they weren't even paid their wages, and so forth. And this is about, you know, a discussion that, there was, there was an eight-month period where there was a, a brief window of democracy in the in the in the Saudi media, where these letters actually came out, and I was able to capture them. People complaining about salary differences from coming from different countries. We'll skip these. Um, okay. So so one of the one of the things that Saudi Arabia has has tried to do is try to uh, it has made you know sincere attempts to try to diversify the economy. And the diversification means that, means that well, okay, the economy is 90% oil, and so we want to create other industries. We want to we want to do some agriculture because otherwise we we have to import all of our food from from the outside. The only part of Saudi Arabia that has any natural agriculture is in the in this in this area, right? Could you give some idea the extent of the oil fields? So the oil the oil fields are are in this area. And they extend, you know, about probably about down to here. Oh, so so essentially from from Kuwait, okay, from Kuwait, and actually there's something called the neutral zone. So from the neutral zone all the way down to the empty quarter. So let me make a recommendation that you not talk to him because he'll ask you questions all the time. Sorry, I'm gonna yeah, okay. I have to I have to be disciplined. Um, and, and so, so, the, so some of these cities, so these are three cities that, that were built from scratch. Uh, Jebel in 1975, Yan al-Bahar uh, on, the, on the west coast, and then a new one that is proposed in where Nihom. So Nihom is, is, it's a funny, it's a very funny acronym. So Nihom is, is this one up here, it, it isn't built yet. But the current Crown, Crown Prince proposed it, to build Neon, but I, I, I'm, I'm sort of amused by the acronym. See, it's a, it's a hybrid, which is Neo Mustaqbal. So Mustaqbal is the word, is the, the Arabic word for future, for new future. <laughs> Funny name. Um, but a lot of things are, are segregated, so you get on a bus, there's a men's section, there's a women's section. They're very unequal. So the men's section is in front, it's 80% of the bus. The women's section is in the back, it's 20% of the bus. Um, the, the only kind of, of, um, of uh, 
sort of equivalent to a national assembly. It's not really a national assembly because it's only advisory. It has no real authority. But it discusses issues. And be before 2011, it was all male, as you can see here. It was all male. In, in 2011, they decided to admit some, some women into the, the Majlis of Shura. And, but they had, a set, they had to sit in a separate section of the, of the council. The, the real power is in the Council of Ministers, which is dominated by royal family and is all male. Um, let's skip that. Let's skip that. This is, this is Saudi National Guard. Uh, this, is a, this is another militia, so maybe a fourth force. Um, these are some uprisings. So in, in 2011, the Arab Spring, there were a few uprisings in, uh, in Saudi Arabia, but they were all crushed. Uh, with it very, 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 very quickly. A few hundred people here, 50 people here, the police swooped in, arrested everybody, and it was done. Um, that's why I say that Saudi Arabia is by far the most oppressive country in, in the Middle East. And uh, the only other one that's equal to it is Bahrain, but that's because in, in March of, of 2011, Saudi, Saudi Arabia basically basically took control of, of, of Bahrain. Um, Manal al-Sharif was the... But then after the Arab Spring, there were a number of other protests that, that had some impact. So the, Manal al-Sharif was the, the first woman to, to lead... I wouldn't say she was the first, but she was the... She, she got some attention um, by getting into a car and, and driving in defiance of the, the Saudi ban on women driving. And uh, and then we have uh, Raif al Badawi, uh, who is a blogger, a Saudi blogger, who has who's been in jail since 2012. He's still there, I think. Uh, Nimr al Nimr is the is a, a, relig a Shia religious leader uh, in in the East who was uh, executed for uh, for what he said. Um, uh, in 2016, that's his. That's his son executed. And then, of course, the most recent case of Jamal Khashoggi, the Washington Post journalist, who was uh, killed in uh, in the Saudi consulate in Istanbul in in 2018. The only reason that, that I mean, that what I find sort of surprising is that the the West has made a lot of fuss for good reason. It's a good thing that the West has made a lot of fuss about the Khashoggi killing. But it's tragic that it took the killing of Khashoggi to, to raise this to the surface, the human rights violations in Saudi Arabia, to bring that to the surface. It's only because he, he, was, he had a US citizenship, he was a Washington Post reporter, and you know the West could not ignore him. And, the, and certainly the Washington Post would not let us ignore him. Um, but he's not, he's not alone. There, there have been so many other cases of, of people getting executed. And of course, it was particularly brutal because of the way, because enough information was obtained about how he was killed uh, through Turkish intelligence. I mean, they, there, was, there were recordings where they could actually hear the sound of the, of the bone saw of him being cut up. Um, now, Another thing that's, that's interesting that has never happened in Saudi Arabia before is, is where you have a crown prince who is placed in an impossible position. So from 2015 to 2017, after King Salman became the king, uh, the crown prince, who's the, his successor, uh, was a, a nephew. And, um, and, and um, his son, the king's son, Prince Mohammed bin Salman was the was the deputy crown prince. So here you've, you've got a man in the middle, uh, and and he's in an impossible position because the man below him is the son of the man above him, and the man below him has this ambition. And so it's sure enough, in 2017, the the king found a pretext to get rid of him, and and make his own son the the uh, the crown prince. Now, I want to say something about the, the you know, which relates to the Khashoggi killing, because the question is, how could this be done 
you know, Saudi Arabia has never admitted that Crown Prince um, Mohammed bin Salman gave the order to uh, to, to to murder Khashoggi. And I'll tell you something about you know from my experience. So one thing is that is that in Saudi Arabia it, and it's very very strict. It's it's to a a, a level of, of military discipline that there is always a chain of command. There's always a chain of command, and and nobody steps out of the chain of command to to make a decision like this unless the the head of the chain of, of command. Now, this is already a major decision. Were these guys related? No. This, uh, I'm not going. I'm going to answer questions at the end. Um, and and so. Uh, well, uh, to, give me a, to give you an example of, a, of a chain, how a chain of command works is that if I want to communicate with somebody in another department, I don't just simply send a memo to somebody in another department, even an email. I have to send it through my boss, through his boss, and then until there's, a, there's, a, there's a, a commonality. And then, and then I have to through, send it through all of them before it goes to that, that other person in the other department. That's, that's what chain of command means. And it means many things, but that's one of the things it means. Secondly, there was, there was talk that, oh, you know, there was a, a security official who, who passed uh, Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman in the hallway. And he said, he asked the Crown Prince, uh, what should I do about Khashoggi? And there was some passing comment that, oh, just figure it out and do whatever you want to do. It, it doesn't happen that way in Saudi Arabia. Important decisions, discussions never take place in the hallway. Never. They always take place behind closed doors. Um, and what's important for anybody in the chain of command is that you realize that whatever whatever decision you make, it has to make your boss look good. Okay. And then the the personalities. What I'm talking about here is that when you have a, a young Saudi, who has this suddenly has this tremendous power, and it goes to their heads. It, it really does, and because I have I have personal experience of, of dealing with with a Saudi, um, you know, director, um, and and this is this is the this is what they've done. So they make a lot of sort of rash decisions, um, and and they're very very authoritarian about it. You know. They, Made the decision, right or wrong, you got to, you have to follow and do it. And of course, then you know where does the money come from? It only come, you know, everything has to be authorized from the top of the chain of command. So that's why that, that that's why I think it's pretty convincing that that Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman gave the order to assassinate Jamal Khashoggi. I'm going to skip these. So, so these are these are some websites that protest protested against the against the kingdom. Um, and I, I just want to say this is that is that what this says here in, in Arabic is is the the Islamic movement for reform. So the names are important. Names are very important. And the name here that that was chosen in in Arabic um, is chosen because. Anyone who, who wants to take on the monarchy, the only basis that, that one has to, to, to take on the monarchy is the, the legitimacy that is provided by Islam. So that's why it's, this is called an Islamic movement for reform. Reform is also important because it's designed to be as gentle as possible. As gentle as possible. We only want little changes. But the English version of this because this is the I'm sorry, this is the Arabic website. This is the English website, and the English one says we seek regime change and reform in Saudi Arabia. We have a comprehensive plan for power, and we are ready to govern. So it's it's not that's not some, um, and of course both of these websites were taken down. Uh, I just want to mention about a little bit about some of the contradictions. So here's a. This is the, there's the ride healing. Taxis are now available in, in, in Saudi Arabia, especially in uh, Riyadh, Jeddah. And one of the, the curious things is that, is that Saudis are, 
are very reluctant to do menial work. You know, they, they want all the all the glamorous jobs, the decision-making jobs. And the only exception to that is driving taxis. <laughs> so it's, all the taxi drivers in Saudi Arabia are, are Saudi. The other thing I want to say about this is, is about driver's licenses, to understand some of the contradictions, some very simple contradictions. So if you want to get a driver's license in Saudi Arabia, guess what? You have to go and buy a car first. <laughs> and then you can get your driver's license. Not the other way around. Um, and then this is, uh, you know, women started driving because Prince Mohammed bin Salman gave, they gave, well, told his father to, uh, it's okay to give a royal degree um, allowing women to, to, to drive. But the real reason for it is not because of any kind of liberalism, but because he wants to modernize the economy. And you can't modernize the economy if half the population have to have to be driven around everywhere and can't get out of the house. Right? Uh, all I want to say about this is that is that you see how how women, uneducated women in Saudi Arabia, basically they, they resign to being in the home, they don't seek work. And so, so this is the, the number of people who apply for unemployment at, at different levels of education, with, with different levels of education. So the women who, are, who complete graduate school, a huge number of them, I mean much more than men, are applying for jobs. And so these women are, are applying for jobs and not getting it, let's put it that way. So there's a lot of unemployment among women in, in post, who have postgraduate education. So one of the secret revolutions that's happening in Saudi Arabia and in the rest of the world is university attendance by women versus men. So we're talking about the, the women are the red or the orange part of these circles. And um, so Saudi Arabia, uh, let's see, where, it's that one over there. So that's Saudi Arabia. And this is a few years ago. This is a few years ago and 52% of university students were women even in Saudi Arabia. Now, this has happened because, not only because universities are free, but also because Saudi Arabia at some point, because of criticism, it decided, okay, we're going to create some universities that are ex exclusively for women. And you see that in some other countries like, like Qatar and, and Iran, the, num the number of university women, the number of students who are women is over 60%. Can you point to those? So, so Qatar is here, 63 percent, and Iran. Well, so so is 49 percent here, but today it's 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 in the high it's in the mid 60s, 60 percent. In other words, almost two thirds of university students in Iran, the Islamic Republic, are women. Reason for that is because there isn't that much for them to do. It's harder for them to get jobs, and but it's it's a way where it, it's a path where women can get some kind of fulfillment. Uh, another contradiction. So th this, this is the, the uh, Makkah, Makkah uh, over 100 years ago. And uh, you see in the background, in, in the background is a, an Ottoman castle, um, many, many hundreds of years old. Uh, I mean, it would be a historic treasure in, in, any, in any place. But in the early 2000s, Saudi Arabia decided to demolish that castle to build this. Okay. So, so this, this is, this is a, a, it's a, it's a, it's a multi-purpose complex with, with several hotels, including a Fairmont Hotel, a Marriott, and um, now it's, the, but the most glaring thing, of course, is, is the way it, it towers over the Kaaba, right? Remember, this, this country is supposed to be the guardian of the Kaaba. They're supposed to, to uplift it, not tower over it. And this is the way I, I look at it. And I, I know that there are other, other Muslims who, who look at this in horror, thinking about what, what the kingdom is, is doing. This building, by the way, uh, this is another view of it, 
is, is uh, a Brajal Beit, the, the, the tower of the house. By house, we mean the house of God. And it is by far, in terms of, of covered square footage, it is the largest building in the world. Okay, so it's, um, yeah, it's, there's, there's, no, there's no other building that even comes close. And, and that's, that is the World Trade Center, WTC1. Saudi Arabia, how much time do we have? Yeah, well, uh, we have to stop around 12.15, we'll over, so you probably give a little bit of time for questions. So how much, how many minutes do I have? Uh, say 10. Okay, thanks. Um, if you look at the Saudi Arabian flag, you see that it, it has these, these Arabic words on it, La ilaha, La, uh, so, so there is, there's no God, but God in, in, and, uh, you know, uh, Muhammad is the, is the, uh, the messenger of God. So the same slogan is, is, on, is on all of the, the flags of the, fund, of the religious fundamentalist groups, the Taliban, Al-Qaeda, and Daesh, or, the, or ISIS. So the, the, there is something in common. So what I'm saying here, or what I'm trying to suggest here, is that Saudi Arabia projects this, this uh, ideological framework that is the same ideological framework under which the other religious militant organizations have arisen. Uh, so th this is Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, and um, th these are uh, just some some cartoons about um, you know how comparing how how ISIS does things and how how the Saudis do exactly the same thing that, that ISIS does beheadings executions for for people who are critical or of or perceived as being critical of the the power structure in in Saudi Arabia and the barbarity and so on and, and um, so this is um, okay here's another one so so the, the, there was an exhibit <coughs> uh, that that came to San Francisco uh, in, a few years ago from Saudi Arabia and it consisted of these these statues and uh, every one of the statues had the the face blown out. Everyone. Now, now the, the exhibit came, but there was no comment about that fact. But but every statue had no face. And the reason for this is that in in fundamentalist Islam, there are no there are not supposed to be any human images. You don't take a face and, and you don't make statues. You don't make you don't put portraits on the wall. Um, and have images of, of human beings, and certainly not the, the Prophet Muhammad. But guess what? <laughs> <laughs> this is the Saudi currency. You know, the, the, the kings are, are, are all the currency notes. Um, the the religious the, the other religious party in Egypt, other than the Muslim Brotherhood, was Jabhat uh, uh, has been known. So Hizb al Nur um, is is a, is a political party in in Egypt that that really was formed you know right after the Arab Spring. It came out of not, out, out of nowhere, and in the in the first parliamentary election in Egypt, it won a quarter of the seats right, after uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. It was funded. Well, one of its major sources of funding has been Saudi Arabia. So what? So now we sort of understand why Saudi Arabia is so opposed to the Muslim Brotherhood, because it competes with the organization that it really supports from an ideological perspective, which is, which is the, has been the party of light. And when I traveled in the villages of Egypt, this is all I could see. I mean, this was during the elections, and there were there were no signs for the Muslim Brotherhood, but there were all these signs for the. For the the party of party of light. So anyway, it's evidence of the of this. This is the Saudi imprint on on Egypt, part of it. And then Saudi 
Saudi Arabia has sent, has sent money to, to madrasas or Islamic schools around the world. I mean, even even in Europe, even in, in India, a lot of the a lot of these Islamic schools are, <coughs> are are funded. No, they're well, most of them are, but not all of them. But, but this is sort of the Middle East. And um, what do we have here? So uh, this is just to show you the, the relationship of Saudi Arabia to Iran. And I'm going to talk. I'm going to talk about that uh, next time. No. Yes. Okay. Thank you. And Saudi Arabia is, um, in terms of percentage of GDP, is is the by far the largest spender on on of on military. Is <coughs> is the largest. It spends over ten percent of its budget on on the military. Canada, one percent. Uh, it's also, for the most part, except for one year, it was, it was one year when India uh, surpassed Saudi Arabia in, in arms import. Remember, Saudi Arabia is a country of 32 million people. India has 1.3 billion. <laughs> so, <laughs> big difference. Uh, Saudi Arabia, since 2015, has been conducting a war against Yemen that uh, the United Nations has called them the worst humanitarian crisis, um, perhaps after Syria, uh, and that there's only recently there's there's been there have been some attempts at a ceasefire, there've been negotiations, and uh, at least the level of killing has come down. But most importantly, our own Congress at least has, has stepped up, and and uh, the, the Senate uh, and the House have both taken moves to. To, uh, with a bill to stop U.S. arms sales to Saudi Arabia until the, the Yemen war comes to an end. Uh, Trump, of course, is very likely to veto that, unfortunately. And finally, my last, this is a cartoon I used previously with it, um, where what I'm trying to show here, of course, is that the United States, in supporting Saudi Arabia and, and other forces like Saudi Arabia, that we are funding a country that created the ideological framework for ISIS and Al Qaeda, and so in a sense we have some role in in the creation of these of these organizations. And the other role that we play, of course, is that by starting wars that were unnecessary, like the the war in Iraq, right? the, the 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 war in Libya. The, you know, so basically, what has happened is that is that countries like like uh, Iran, Syria, Libya, that had yes, they had very authoritarian governments. Yes, they were human rights violations. But when you take take that apart, and you end up with chaos, you end up with different groups fighting each other, and there's no end. And and Afghanistan, um, you create a a fertile ground. For, for the growth of, of organizations like Al Qaeda and ISIS. And so that's that's why this this cartoon. So I'll stop it there and uh so you have our speaker at hand. Five minutes, which means keep your statements and your questions short, prefer questions. Uh, what's the chance that the oil tankers that were bombed last week, uh, and we know that the Saudis are not on really good terms with the Iranians, uh, what's the chance that Saudi Arabia has anything to do with, with that? Um, so the, the, the question is, what is the chance that Saudi Arabia has something to do with the, with the, uh, the, the tar targeting of oil tankers and the in the Arabian Gulf, uh, because of its conflict with Iran. I mean, anything is 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 possible, uh, because uh, it, it's. I mean, it, there there's so many cases in history where where something that um, you know, it, 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 you would logically think, okay, it's being done by by one party, but it may be done by the other, because because then it be, it creates a pretext for. Uh, for uh, Saudi Arabia saying, look, we, we are being victimized, please please help us, or it creates a pretext for them acting militarily. So, um, 
that this is, uh, it, it's cer certainly possible. Um, there are a lot of missing pieces in the, in the information that we are given. That, okay, there's some videos, but the, peop the people who are in those videos are unidentified. So who, how can we prove that these people are Iranians? How can we prove that, okay, they, they, took, a, they took a mine off a vessel. Were they helping the vessel by removing the mine? Or were they, you know, they weren't placing it there. We know that. Uh, so there are a lot of questions that, that I think we should keep an open mind. Is, is there control or filtering by the government of the citizens of Western media and Internet? In Saudi Arabia, yeah. is, is is there filtering of the media? Um, so so definitely. So so the, I mean, th there are certain things that Saudi Arabia cannot filter, such as because most homes in Saudi Arabia have satellite television. Um, so they can't filter the what comes across from the satellites. But the the media in in Saudi Arabia is is it's not government controlled, but you know. The thing is, that if you want to survive as a newspaper in Saudi Arabia, you know what the rules are. Because if you if you violate those rules, you will be shut down. Um, and so there is there is this this self censorship. Um, so in that sense, news is controlled. But um, Saudis get other sources of news. What Saudi Arabia has tried to do is to is, is to eliminate some of the competition. So, for example, one of the things that Saudi Arabia has tried to do, uh, beginning with the boycott of, of Qatar, is to try to shut down Al Jazeera, because Al Jazeera has a, a narrative that is, that is not consistent with the Saudi narrative. Hi, Dan St. George. Good morning. Good morning. I wanted to ask if women still have to wear the burqa on the street. My neighbor, uh, who is a physician, went to work in Saudi Arabia for a short time with her husband, uh, and they were working in a hospital. But when she went out on the street in Western clothes, she was yelled at and chased and everything. So she found that in order to go outside the hospital, she had to put on a burqa. And also her, her husband, uh, observed a public execution, and uh, it was a big deal. He said he was going to some city to give a, a talk, and uh, he said, "Why are all these people coming to the hotel? Why is everything so busy?" And the hotel clerk said, "Oh, it's a public execution, <laughs> and uh, in fact, the executioner has the room next to you." <laughs> <laughs> and I just wondered if that's still going on. Yes. So, so two questions. So, so one is about public executions. They are still going on. The interesting about them is that they actually want people to go and watch the public executions in a in a public square. Um, but they're very strict about about not allowing anybody to to take photos. So it's a curious contradiction. You want to you see it, but don't photograph. Uh, on the question of women. With the burqa, so women. If you go to Saudi Arabia, you will find that. Well, first of all, it depends on where in the country. So, in the center of the country, where, which is the most conservative, so Riyadh is the most conservative area of the country, and so most women, certainly Saudi women, will go out in a burqa. It's not required. What is required is that is that they they yeah. So so they they wear a hijab and and be covered. You know, so they have always long sleeves, and then their, their dress goes all the way down to the, the feet. So uh, that's the minimum. If you go to, to Jeddah, um, you will find many fewer burqas. Uh, women will still wear the, the hijab. Uh, but it's more liberal. It's a, it's, a, it's a city that has, you know, it's a trading city, and, and so... Uh, it's, it's a much more liberal place. Even even Mecca and Medina, the, the religious centers are more liberal than Riyadh.